我们现在我们的讲者是呃来自瓜地马拉的 Jorge Cajas， 然后呃他是当地的 Java 用户组的负责人之一，然后他们在二零一六年的 Duke's Choice Award 中取得胜利。那他在开发电子银行及企业环境中的呃 Java 应用这方面已经有超过七年的经验。那今天的题目主要是在讨论 filters、listeners 跟 interceptors 在取得通用代码之后，如何使开发会变得更有趣。好，那我们现在就欢迎辉卡哈斯。So hello everyone,、uh, thank you for assisting to my session for the future because for me. So this is still November 18. So you are in the future for me. Okay. So we are going to talk about a little bit about filters and receptors. So I think that I was already introduced, but my name is Juan Carlos. I am a consultant from the company named Mango Chango. I am a junior leader of Pinot Noir Mala, and I'm organizer of a conference like this for Pinot Noir Mala. I have more than eight years of experience working with Java in event solutions, for solutions, and so on. I'm a Oracle Certified Associate、uh, Certifier, and I love to speak to conferences. I'm a、uh, speaker since、uh, 2012. So, if you want to contact me,、uh, here are my my Twitter, my LinkedIn, and my GitHub, and everything because and all of the social media I have as a Carlos Mota handle. So, let's get started. We're going to talk about filters and interceptors. Why? Because normally in our everyday life,、uh, as a programmers and developers, we need to repeat some of the tasks every time that we、uh, work a new endpoint. That every time that we do a new business logic on the backend or something like that. So the filters and interceptors are going to make our life more easier. So for this session, I assume that you, that you have a little bit of experience working with Java E, that now is renamed as a Java E. You don't know how to generate all of the intellectual property of Java AE to the presentation, but Java is a framework, so we need to rebrand re it as a Java AE. But Java AE and Java AE are practically the same. Just Java AE is the new name for the Java AE, and we are going to create all of the new APIs under the Java AE name. Also, we are going to move all of the packages that were on the Java Java X、uh, namespace to Java AE. But basically, Java AE is the same as Java AE. Okay, so what we're going to talk、uh, today, we're going to talk about the filters that are two types, interceptors that also are two types. I'm going to talk about JPL listeners. So we're going to see the theory a little bit quickly, so we can get、uh, the hands of the, the demo. Because on the demo, you are going to understand well how this works. So let's get started. The first thing that we're going to see are the filters.、Uh, the filters are always executed, no matter if the resource exists or not. The filters are always executed.、Uh, we're going to talk about a little bit about this later. But the first、uh, principle of a filter on the JavaS、uh, world, on the Jakarta world, is that the filter is always executed. What you can do with a filter? Well, you can modify some properties of the request or the response, like the HTTP headers. Uh, you can use the filters on the plane or the or server side. How is that? Well, with Java OS, you can use it as normally as you can do on the server side, exposing some endpoints. But also, you can use Java OS to consume some endpoints for external resources. So you are still on the server, but for an external resource, you are the client, and for your client, you are the server. So for Java OS, there are two types: the client side and the server side. So the filters you can use it on the main side or the server side on your business logic. And there are two types of filters:、uh, the pre-matching and post-matching. So let's continue. The pre-matching filters are executed before searching the resource. That is that. So imagine that you are going to hit an endpoint that is a slash resource, and you have a pre-matching filter. This filter is going to be executed. Before the container or the server search for this resource, so doesn't matter if the slash resource exists or not. This filter is going to be executed. On this filter, you can modify the HTTP value,、uh, HTTP here values, but you cannot modify the body content. What's that? So if you have, for example, a post 
endpoint and this post has a payload, you cannot modify the payload. You can only modify some properties like the HTTP headers, but not the body content. And for a filter to be um, a pre-matching type, you need to annotate it with a pre-matching annotation of the WP class. So you can use this kind of filters, for example, for an internal redirect. Imagine that you have a new API version, but you need to support all versions of the API. So you can use this kind of filter to redirect uh, the old uh, URL. So for example, b1 slash users to b2 slash users. And the client is not, uh, don't notice that there is a new version. It just can use the, the old version as nothing. Or maybe you can use a different uh, method, a different source based on the role of users. So you can basically do a redirect this type of filter. And this is executed before the resource is searched. And no, doesn't matter if the resource is found, if the resource exists, this filter is always to be executed. Another type of filter that we have are the post matching filters. This is the default behavior for a filter. Basically, this filter is executed. Doesn't matter if the resource exists or not, like the pre-matching filter, but this is going to be executed after searching for the for the method. So what's the difference? So in this uh, kind of filter, you can already direct uh, the the request because the request is going is already going to be tied to a new to a, to a resource, or it's going to be tied to the uh, not found uh, response. You still can uh, modify the HTTP value filters. You still can cannot modify the body. So the only difference between the pre-matching and post-matching is the order of the filters. The pre-matching is going to be executed before searching the resource, and the post-matching, that is the default behavior, is going to be uh, executed after searching for the resource. For the resource. On the pre-matching filter, you can do a redirect. On the post-matching filter, you cannot do a redirect. But the most common use case for the filters are the for matching. Uh, you can use it on the request or on the response. So you can have a request filter or a response filter. One for intercepting the, the request and one for, for intercepting the response before you send it to the client. So this is how the matching filter works. Uh, I hope that you can read this uh, slide, but basically, as you can see is that the first line is the provider annotation that registered this filter into the just OS environment that you have. Then you have the pre-matching annotation to convert this filter into a pre-matching filter. As you can see, this is a container request filter. That means that you are going to intercept the request from the client before processing it on your endpoint. Uh, you need to override the filter method by implementing the container request filter class. Basically, what you can do to do here is redirect the client to another response, to another uh, endpoint, to another method, or something like that. We say that the filters are already executed, no matter if the resource is uh, found or not found, but we can do something like a conditional execution. This is very easy. What you need is to type the endpoint or the class or the result that you want to filter or, or intercept with an annotation and use the same annotation on the filter. So as you can see here, before my provider annotation, I have this secure annotation. We are going to see in the demo how this works. And also I can assign a priority to the filter. So the filters are always executed in order and you can modify that order by uh, setting a provider. A priority. This priority comes uh, from zero to the infinity to the integer limit. Uh, so basically, this is just a number. Okay, they, they see that the scale to the screen is too small. Uh, let me change a little bit this. I'm going to stop sharing and we share me my screen. Yeah, okay. So let's continue. Uh, we were talking about uh, the conditional distribution of a filter. So basically what we do is that we type two components of the, or the application. One is the resource class that is, for example, our endpoint that objects OS, and the other one is the filter using a common annotation. So for example, right here, you can see that it uses this secure annotation, annotating the filter. 
Here is my annotation uh, definition. As you can see, this is just an annotation that has this another annotation that says name building. This annotation is going to be retained for the old time. So this is going to persist after the compilation. And you can just use this annotation at this level of the method or at the plus uh, level. And so, for example, I here has this um, endpoint that this is slash users annotated with security. So every method that we have inside this class is going to be intercepted by this filter because we use it via security annotation right here on the controller. And right here on the filter. If the filter and the controller or the method has, oh, and you adjust the resolution for three the bit. Okay, so let me change the resolution of the. Okay, we were talking about um, the conditional execution of filters. So just for uh, repeating myself, you need to create a new annotation and use the same annotation on the filter and on the result that you want to intercept. Uh, don't worry if you don't understand this because in the demo it's going to be all clear. So let's continue with the theory. Uh, the next one are the interceptors. Um, one thing that is different from the interceptor and the filters are that the interceptors are not always executed. They are only executed if the resource is found and you can modify the body of the, of the request or the response on the interceptor. And the filter is always uh, executed and you cannot modify the body. The interceptor is not always executed, but you can modify the body. You can still use this on the client side or the server side. Also, there are two types of interceptors. The real interceptor that basically is intercepting the request and the right interceptor that basically is intercepting the response before sending it to the client. So a real interceptor is very easy to create. Basically, you'll see the same annotation provider that registered this interceptor into your Jack service environment. Uh, you need to implement the real interceptor class. And basically, right here, you can uh, modify the body or the HTTP headers of the, of the request. Uh, the same is for the right interceptor. Uh, you need to register with the provider, implement the right interceptor class. And you, right here, can modify the response before sending it to play. We're going to see this uh, with more detail on the, on the demo. Another thing that we can use for intercepting the response to the client are the section mappers, uh, because sometimes the application is going to fail. Uh, for example, we're going to have a uh, error 500 and error 504 as uh, so of what kind of, of error. And maybe you are going to use all GISM for your client, but sometimes your uh, application server is going to return an HTML for the error. So with the session mapper, we can register a new mapper that is basically an interceptor that takes that exception, and you can modify it to send it in a more uh, elegant way to your client. There is still the error, but you are going to work with more style. Uh, you are going to fail with more style. Again, this is going to this is just the theory, but I'm going to look it very quickly because in the demo it's going to be more clear. And the third one that we're going to see in the demo are the JPI listeners that oh this is in Spanish. Sorry. This is executed on the life cycle of an entity on, on the JPI. So you can do something on the purposes, on the pre update, on the pre-delete, and also you can do something on the post persist, post update, or pre-delete. So basically, this is just uh, handling the life cycle of an entity on the JPI world, and you can do something uh, after or before the entity gets persisted, the better or the later of the database. So how this is how a, a listener looks. Basically, is request scoped because you need to create a new uh, instance of this listener every time that you have a a request. For example, we have the purposes that uh, set the created at and created by uh, columns on the on the entity. You pay a date that updates who updated this uh, this entity and the public move that because maybe you are doing uh, soft deletes and you want to know who deleted the, the entity from the database. So this is what's uh, the jury. The summary is that filters are always executed, 
intercept or not, how was executed. Uh, the filters only modify the HTTP headers. The, the interceptors can modify the HTTP headers and the query content. You have exception mappers to capture the exception and convert it to a more readable a format to reply. And the JPL listeners can help you to do something on the pre persist or, or post persist, re update, post update, re remove, or post remove life cycle of the entity. So let's go into the demo. Good. Okay. Uh, this is a very standard Jakarta E or Java E project. Uh, the one thing that we are going to use is Quarkus because it's very easy to configure. Uh, we are going to take a look at the, the dependencies. Basically, we have the just RS and the JSON mailing implementation by Quarkus. Also, we have the dependency injection implementation again by Quarkus. The database driver, uh, this time is going to be MySQL, and we're going to use Ethernet as the JPI implementation. And we are going to use a very number just to not write the get and set and all of that uh, for your stuff. Okay, so basically, what we have right here is a uh, RS endpoint. As you can see, if this is the root, and just return a hello world. And let me test it. I'm going to change to Cosma. I'm going to send it. Oh, I think that I need to run for it before using it. Okay, that's starting. Focus is compiling. And I think that we are done. Let me test it. Okay, let's start there. Okay, so our basic endpoint is just like that. You just wrote down a no word. So the first thing that we're going to do is to create an interceptor. This is going to be our response interceptor because we want that all of the responses that we have. They are going to be on JSON format and with a specific format. So what is the format? We are going to always return this kind of object. We are going to have a Boolean fly that is going to be if the request is success or not, and string message. So maybe there is an error. We need to report the user what error was that, and the data that is going to be the response that we have on our points. So we are going to write this response interceptor. As you can see, I'm going to uncomment this. This is the provider annotation to register this uh, endpoint into the environment. It just implements the white method setup, the around white method, that we have the context as a parameter. From the context, I'm going to have uh, to get the entity. The entity is going to be any object. I'm going to ask if this entity is uh, inside of an exception. If it's an exception, I'm going to parse this to cast it into an exception, I'm going to set the, the success flag to false, and I'm going to set the message as the exception message. But if it's any kind of um, object, I'm going to set the success to true. I'm going to set this is a message. I'm going to set the data as whatever we have as a return for the methods. Also, for this interceptor, uh, we are going to replace the entity with our new response, that is the one that we're going to be argued. Uh, the response type is going to be the standard response. And just for you, as you can see, I can set the headers. I'm going to say that this application JSON and the media type is going to be application JSON. So for an interceptor, this is our response interceptor that is going to intercept the response, modify the content, and then send it to the client and just convert whatever we have to this object. So we have the all of the responses as in the standard way. So this is going to change from just a hello. To a new JSON. As you can see, the hello is start here, but it's inside the data uh, property. 
Now we have the message and we have the user flag. How do we do that? Yes, we did that just using a wider interceptor. That is basically an interceptor for the response before the response is going to send to the client. Another thing that we can use is a, a filter. The most common case for a filter is the authentication filter. So as you can see, I'm going to use my security annotation that I created right here. It's basically just annotation with a name being annotation that you can use it at the method level or at the class level. And this authentication filter is going to be very simple. We are going to extract one uh, header from the, from the request. In this case, it's going to be the authorization header. Normally, in the authorization header, you are going to have something like a JWT token or an APC token or something like that. Just for demo purposes, the authorization uh, header is going to be an email. We are going to search on the database for that user. And that if the user is null, so the user doesn't exist on the database, we are going to run an exception as an authorizer. And if not, we are going to set the, the user as an uh, injectable object so we can use it uh, later. So let's see how this works. So for example, we are going to have this endpoint. Uh, the endpoint is going to be this one. As you can see, I'm going to remove the secure addition from, from here. So this endpoint is going to be public. This endpoint, what we do is uh, create a new warehouse with this request. Uh, it just takes a name and an address. So right now, this endpoint is going to be public and anyone can create a new warehouse. So let me see if this is local cost. Host on the port 8018 slash API slash warehouses. Uh, we are going to set the body as a JSON. Let me create a new JSON right here. We're going to set the name as warehouse number four. And the address is going to be just around the corner. Along As you can see, there is no authorization here. So I'm going to send this. Oh, method not allowed because this is a post. Okay, I'm going to send it again. Oh, there is an error. Let me see. I think that before use the database, I need to make the database up. So let me see. Docker. Docker. Ah, my database is up. Okay. Let's try again. And the warehouse is created. As you can see, this uh, endpoint was public because I didn't use it on any other data here. And the warehouse was just created. Let me change it and bind this with the secure annotation. So this endpoint is not going to be intercepted by the authentication filter that we have here. So if I try to create a new warehouse, let me send it. You can see that I got the, the message on a browser right here. If I change this and create the authorization filter, let me authorization. I'm going to send you the email because it is, this is just a demo. And then at email.com. Now I can create the, the warehouse. So basically we use a filter as an authorization filter. Uh, you can search for a token, you can search for a, a basic authentication, for a user password, like that. And based on the result of this filter, you can just put on an exception and break all of the execution or just continue. 
So we say that on this filter, what we did was uh, setting the current user as a JFL object, that is this current user folder. As you can see, I can use this um, JPEG injection because sometimes we are going to have something like this. Let me see one of the tables. As you can see, this table uh, has a lot of uh, columns for updating. So you can see how created the record, who uh, updated the record, when was created, when was uh, deleted, when was updated, and all of the auditing um, uh, columns. But there is a kind of way to start um, every time that you modify or do create a new entity or database to create all of this. So let me. So let me show you how my entity looks. For example, I'm going to use uh, the user entity. As you can see, this is very simple. If you have the mail, I have the name. If we see the warehouse uh, entity, it just has the name and has the address. So where are all of the columns for bidding? Okay, all of that columns are here on the base model. As you can see, here is the ID, the created by, the created app, the created by, the created app. And the deleted flag, and all of the columns are going to be annotated by the by the model by using this annotation, the meta superclass. So you can put all of your common columns on this base model and annotate to the to the proper model using this meta superclass. But also here is another annotation. There is this that is the entity listeners, and on model can have multiple. If it's listeners, uh, right now this is just one that is the base model listener. If you can see this, we have the purposes. But basically, what we do is we get the current user ID, and for the model, we set the created app that is just now, and the created by that is the current user ID. For the pre date, we again we get the current user ID. And we modify the set to data that and the set to data by uh, properties with the now time and the ID. And this ID is returned by the current user folder using a uh, different injection uh, by the CDI object. I get the current user and if the current user is not good, I get the ID. So basically, this code is going to be executed every time that you persist a new entity or every time that you modify a new entity. So if we can see right here, let me see, I can change the, the font size. Uh, where I can see. Um, here, edit. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, I think that this is a little bit more real. You can see that the entity got the created app and the created by automatically. And if we see that on the database, so for example, let me open this one. We can see that this was created by the user number one and created at this time. So let me create another one, but this time we're going to change the user. The user is not going to be the admin, it's going to be the employee. Hmm. I can change this. Oh. This is for the soon. Let me just start postman. Create a new authorization here. So this time is going to be the M G user at email.com. And this is going to be the warehouse number six. So the warehouse is created. Uh, we can run this one. And as you can see, the created by 
was set automatically because of my warehouse service. The only thing that I do is create a new object, set the name, set the address, and just persist it. We are not uh, saving the user, we are not saving the time, we are not doing anything strange, but uh, the listener is going to be to say, oh, this is going to be persistent, I need to get the current user ID, and set the created that time, and set the created by ID. The same happens for the updating, so for example, I'm going to update the warehouse number 6, and it's not around the corner, but it's around the other corner, I'm going to send this. And if we see at the database, oh, database, and we refresh this one, we can see that the number three was updated by the user number one. Again, on the service, I'm not uh, doing that, nothing strange. I just find the warehouse by the ID. If the warehouse is uh, known because it's not found, we show a new exception. And I'm just setting the name and setting the address, and the listener is going to say, oh, this is going to be updated. So I get the current user ID, and set the updated by, and the updated app uh, property automatically. So basically with this, uh, you are going to add more reliable code, because all of the updating uh, columns are going to be set automatically. Uh, you are not going to be worried that you forgot to set the created by or the updated by user on um, some of your entities because all of the entities that inherits from the base model that except for the base model are going to pass from into this base model listener and have all of the auditing uh, fields created automatically. So in summary, you can use uh, your filters. So for example, you can create an authentication filter to see if the user is authenticated or not, or maybe to make a redirection. You can use the interceptors to modify the body of your uh, response or your request. So for example, what we did was changing the way that we responded. For example, I'm going to remove this one. And the API is going to respond to just a um, string. But if we have our interceptor registered, that the string is going to be uh, changed into a standard JSON. And you can use the exception mappers to map the exceptions into a more readable uh, format. So, for example, uh, change it from HTML to, to JSON. That is very easy. Uh, let me show you. Thank you. We have this exception mapper that is uh, implemented exception mapper for this type of exception. And as you can see, what I do is that I get the status code from the exception. I set the entity as the error. I say that it's not HTML anymore, but it's application JSON, and just send the response. So I'm not sending the error as HTML, but instead I set it as a JSON. And also you can use your JPA uh, listener to do something uh, before or after dating, or before or after deleting, or before or after persisting your entity, and make your life more easier. So, any question? All of these calls are going to be uploaded on my GitHub, so you can uh, search for that in a couple of minutes on my Twitter. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at uh, uh, my handle that is at Cajasmota. Uh, Let me show you. I think that was a little bit um, small, but my handle is Mota, and let me this more. Okay, so this is my handle. You can search for this call on my on my Twitter. I'm going to post the repository link in a couple of minutes. Okay, let me see what is this. Okay, yes, I'm going to show my repository of the authorization. Uh, you can search it on the on my Twitter, that is this handle. Uh, okay. 
This is my Twitter handle. You can search for the repository of the session on the Twitter. And uh, yes, my GitHub account is also this same handle. If you want to find me on LinkedIn, on GitHub, on Facebook, on Twitter, or on any social media, this is going to be my channel. So do you have any question about how filters or interceptors or buffers or business works? I think that if we still have a little bit of time, so just for your questions, uh, I think that they are going to be based from uh, Chinese to, to English, so don't worry. So basically with filters, uh, you can reuse uh, most of your logic that you are doing on every endpoint, on every business logic, on every uh, service that you are waiting. You can um, compact all of that uh, logic into a single point and just uh, use it uh, conditionally using the name binding property that you can create an annotation and use this annotation on the endpoint and on the filter and this is going to be executed only on this uh, that's yes, this presentation is also be shared at Twitter. So, for example, right here on the controller, uh, you can see that I just executed a notation on the method right here and right here. What happens if you want to secure all of the methods of this? Uh, Plus, you can remove the security annotation from here and put it at the class level, and all of the methods that are on this class are going to be uh, filtered by the application filter. So you can just uh, secure a single endpoint or all of the endpoints by placing it at the class level. So remember, in this presentation and a repository call are going to be published on my Twitter that is uh, at Tafalmota. Okay, if there is any, any question, I just need to say you gracias, that is thank you for, for Spanish for attending my session. And again, this was very funny for me because you are for the future. For me, in Guatemala, I still know everything, so you watch my session for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.